All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXGS Weekly episode 47, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast format. We've got quite a bunch of things today, along with some pretty... Um, God damn it. <laughs> I just have to screw it up from the beginning. Uh, along with some pretty exciting upcoming news uh, with regards to React and Yarn, as well as some pretty cool releases this time around, or some demos and some very, very interesting stuff uh, on the machine learning and deep learning fronts. So let's get started. The first article we got here today, it's called uh, Let's Talk JavaScript Web APIs. And exactly what it says, this is a very good overview of all the web APIs that are shipped right now in the browser as well, majority of them, because uh, the article talks about can I use and, you know, the importance of checking whether you can actually use those APIs. But then it gives a really good overview of, uh, well, basically all the existing web APIs such as Service Worker, Push API, Crypto API, Payments API, which is relatively new performance API and uh, stuff like, you know, vibration and clipboard API. Do check it out if you are curious about the web APIs. There is a lot of them and a lot more coming quite soon. And, you know, for example, Chrome has a bunch that is shipped behind the flags that are really, really cool. So if you're curious, do check it out. Um, hey, Tim, welcome to the stream. All right, next article we got here is React's native new architecture glossary of terms. So uh, this is an overview of upcoming changes to React Native that were outlined by the React Native team um, a few, I think, weeks ago, uh, basically in a roadmap for the 2019. And it's a really, um, I guess more, so it's not, you know, not really a deep dive, but more of an in-depth look at the changes to the React Native architecture and how it would be different from what we currently have there, right? Uh, so if you are working with uh, React Native and if you are curious about all the internals and what those changes mean for you, specifically stuff like Fabric, like Turbo modules and all that kind of things, this article is not very long, but it will give you a very good understanding of the changes coming. And I'm personally uh, quite excited to see the new uh, JavaScript interface changes that it would allow you to essentially uh, expose Java and Object C objects uh, directly to JavaScript, which is... Uh, I mean, it, you know, I, I don't know how exactly will that work because we uh, I haven't actually had time to deep dive into this, but uh, the author says it's going to be something like RPC to Java and Object C methods. And I'm hoping we would get something similar to what the native script has when you can literally just call um, native functions like JavaScript functions, which uh, would make writing native modules or, you know, cross-platform modules, I guess, way, way more easier because right now this is one of the primary pains, at least for me, when working with React Native, when you have to maintain your own uh, native module, which is a bit of a pain in the ass, but you know, it's not, not impossible. But it would be nice to see it simplified, essentially, which is basically, yeah, React Native has a bright future and all of those proposed uh, changes are quite awesome. So if you're curious, do check this out. Next article we got here is also about React Native. It's called How React Native Constructs App Layouts and How Fabric is About to Change That. So this one is talking specifically about the Fabric, which is the new layouting uh, mechanism, I guess, uh, algorithm uh, within the React Native. And I mean, not just React Native, right? React Native as well, because we had Fabric shipped in desktop React for quite some time now. So this article talks about uh, how does React Native works right now? What is the, what, what's the layouting and how does it exactly happens? And then how the Fabric is gonna change all of that once it is shipped in the React. Again, this is not a deep dive, it's just an overall conceptual overview, but if you are working with React Native and if you are curious about what's coming soon, then do check it out, it is a pretty good overview. Next article we got here is uh, called WebAssembly, neither web nor assembly, but revolutionary. The article is written by uh, Jay Phelps, who is, uh, I mean, uh, like, <laughs> I follow this guy forever and he's really good at basically everything that he does. Uh, he worked at Netflix, he's now working at Google and he ships a lot of really good code and writes a lot of really good articles. So I quite highly recommend uh, checking his stuff out if you haven't seen it yet. So this specific article talks about WebAssembly and is essentially an introduction to what WebAssembly is, right? So what it is, how it works, why do we need it? will it replace JavaScript and that, you know, the title goes like it's actually not WebAssembly, not just web and not quite assembly. 
And he talks about what exactly um, can you do with WebAssembly outside of the web, like, you know, desktop WebAssembly, serverless WebAssembly, crypto and smart contracts. Apparently that's a thing. I didn't even know that exists. So yeah, there's, there's like a bunch of very interesting thoughts in here. So if you are still, um, you know, trying to figure out if WebAssembly is for you, if you need it, if you want it, or maybe you, you just want to learn more about it, this article is a really, really good introduction to it and will give you all the basic knowledge that you need to have about the WebAssembly to understand it on a very basic level, essentially. Right, next article we got here is code splitting for libraries, bundling for NPM with rollup 1.0. Um, I think you should close some tabs. <laughs> I mean, I wish, uh, so this is this is actually uh, just to, you know, before we go to the article, uh, let me address this. Uh, oh, wait, I, I forgot to put the chat on the screen. Let me fix that real quick. So um, the thing is that the tabs you see right now is a tiny portion of um, what I actually have before I collect all these links for BXGS Weekly. So those tabs are just fine. And this is how I go, you know, I go through them and I close one by one. I do not use any tab collections because normally when I read stuff online, I don't have more than a couple of tabs open. But when I do the podcast, I open everything and just close it one by one, you know, this is sort of my flow. But uh, I know what you mean. And this is not the most open tabs I think I've had on this podcast. <laughs> but okay, back to the articles. Um, we got the code splitting for libraries, bundling for NPM with rollup version 1.0. This is essentially a tutorial that uh, teaches you how to make a library that is built with rollup for a bunch of targets, including ES, uh, CommonJS, uh, what, what else there, like the tag for the browser, AMD loaders, and all that kind of stuff. If you already used, um, God damn it, I forgot the name. If you already used rollup and you know how it works, then you won't really find anything new here because this is a very basic tutorial. But if you are, interested in rollup. And by the way, I should just note that rollup is absolutely amazing bundler for libraries. Like I used it in a bunch of them and it's super easy to set up. It's very fast, it's very small. And the bundles it produces are really, really cool. And uh, yeah, so this is a tutorial that will introduce you to just about everything you have to know about it. How does it work? How, how it will do the code splitting? How it will prepare your modules for different formats? How do you configure? Uh, you know, doing stuff like minimizing and I don't know, uh, like, you know, what typically you do with um, before publishing the library essentially, right? So there's nothing uh, super complicated about this, it's relatively simple. But yeah, if you ever wanted to get into rollup and publishing your own libraries with it, this is a really good tutorial to check it out. Next article we got here is JavaScript iterator patterns. Um, just as the title says, it basically walks you through the uh, iterator patterns um, on example of Fibonacci sequence, starting from the functions, as in, you know, you create a function that generates a function generator. So higher order functions go into the iterator protocol and then iterable protocol and then generator. So if you already know all of those things, you won't really find anything new here. If you are still confused about the whole iterator, iterable and generators, then do check it out. It's a very good introduction. Basically similar to Gulp or Grunt, uh, not quite. I mean, Gulp and Grunt are task runners, right? So, and Rollup is specifically a bundler that will bundle the code. Because with Gulp or Grunt, you are not limited to just bundling the code. You have the plugins that do that, of course, but you can go, you can do a lot of other things. While Rollup is specifically focused on taking your entry code and then creating one tiny band bundle that is, you know, targeted for common JS, ES modules or stuff like this. But yes, you definitely could do it with Gulp and Grunts. Uh, I think there's even like Gulp and Grunts uh, rollup plugins if you if you like that, you know. So, but yeah, um, I mean, personally, I've, as I said, I've used uh, rollup more than once, and I would highly recommend that it. it's a really good bundler. All right, continuing, we got get started with TypeScript in 2019. This is an essentially introduction to TypeScript from the very basic. How do you install it? How what what does the project need to have? The TS config then go into the basic uh, types in TypeScript. How do you define them? How do you, you know, type check and everything? How do you figure out arrays? Um, it's a very basic tutorial of, of TypeScript, right? And if you wanted to get on a TypeScript bandwagon and you just didn't quite get the official tutorial, I guess, 
um, maybe wanted a bit more extended one, then do check this one out. It basically has everything to get you started. It is quite simple. It does goes into a bit more complex uh, topics like, for example, generics and union types. Um, but yeah, it's it's overall, you know, a very basic introduction to TypeScript. So if you already know TypeScript, you want to really find anything new here. If you wanted to get into it, then this probably is what you want to check out. It is quite extensive. Next article we got here is metaprogramming in JavaScript with proxies. This is, I would say this is a tutorial for ES6 proxies. It shows you how you can use ES6 proxies to actually add the custom methods to a specific object. And it basically walks you through all the possible, or, or I guess not the possible, all the features that ES6 proxies actually have, like so how you can uh, override the has, get, set, own keys, and delete property methods. Basically, this is what proxy allows, right? And um, this use a database as an example, and then they construct the database proxy that actually overrides the methods and allows you to do some things essentially, right? So if you are curious about proxies, then check it out. This is a pretty good introduction. If you already know how proxies work, then well, there's nothing really new here. Um, I mean, proxies are a relatively simple concept, but is it is incredibly powerful one and it might take some time to wrap your head around it um so this you know this is a pretty good starting point okay next article we got here is node.js multi-threading what are worker threads and why do bleh. <laughs> let's try this again node.js multi-threading what are worker threads and why do they matter so this is one more article i guess we're going to see quite a bunch of them lately because worker threads are now enabled in node by default right and people are starting to try and figure out what exactly are the worker threads, how do they work, and how do you use them, and why do you need them at all, right? So this article goes a bit more in depth, I guess. So it first talks about, okay, so node is actually single-threaded, right? So kind of single-threaded. And there are ways of working with the synchronous code, and then there's CPU-intensive tasks that can bottleneck your code. The solutions are, well, a bunch of them like you know having working on ticks splitting the data in chunks working off the processes and stuff like this but now we actually have worker threads that are kind of threads right so they are i mean not kind of they're literally threads so uh, the article still says that it's experimental api which is not quite true because they are now enabled by default in node 11 but um, there you go i mean the article talks about node 10 which is lts and which indeed has them behind the flag but uh, yeah, so if you are, if you're curious about the worker threads, and if you wanted a brief introduction and explainer of why the hell would you use them, then this article is quite good Do have a look. Right, next thing we got here is why every new web app at PayPal starts with TypeScript. This is an um, article from Ken C. Dots. You probably know him, he's quite, um, quite active and you know writing articles and doing tutorials and all that kind of stuff he's a really cool author and if you haven't seen his stuff do check him out so um, the article talks about applying typescript at paypal and why they actually switched from flow to typescript and how how it went for them and why was it better right so if you're curious about that, there is a lot of pretty interesting insights into that. Uh, pretty interesting, like how they went from the flow to TypeScript, what changes they did, what kind of things happened, what's, why did it take so long, and so on and so forth. It is quite interesting. Essentially, it's, you know, migration journey uh, for a relatively large code base, because, I mean, as you can imagine, uh, PayPal is a big company, right? And they have a lot of uh, libraries and projects. So... It is always interesting to read stuff like this, so I highly recommend checking it out if you are interested in TypeScript. If you're already using TypeScript, then well, you won't really find anything you know new or unexpected here. Okay, next article we got here is animating URLs with JavaScript and emoji. Yes, it is as insane as it sounds and as insane as the page looks. Like this, this header is just amazing. Like okay, I, I can't. Like this is awesome. So, um, ex exactly as the title says. The author takes the uh, emojis and then uh, puts them into the URL bar and animates them, which which makes them, you know, like makes a progress bar out of them or makes a um, moving, I don't know, animated moon or face or whatever. It looks ridiculous. It sounds ridiculous and it is ridiculous, but it's a pretty fun exercise, I guess. So you could, um, yeah, have a look at it. There is some issues related to it so the the article is really good and it even goes into caveats related to that because you cannot 
endlessly change the location and use the history API because there are some security errors that will arise from that. You try to change it specifically more than 100 times per 30 seconds, which is still a lot, you know, you don't, you, you don't really need to animate it that much, but it is a silly article that is quite fun. And um, yeah, you, you, can, you can do ridiculous things with that. So do check it out. Next article we got here is EEG motor image reclassification in Node.js with BCI.js. So this talks about using the uh, brain computer interfaces and specifically uh, electroencephalography, right? To uh, create a classifier that would actually allow you to uh, do something to that uh, BCI data, right? So in this case, the author doesn't use the hardware device. I think we already had one of the articles in the previous um, BIS.js weeklies where the author used specifically the uh, classifying the data that comes directly from the headset. In this case, the data is pre-recorded, so there are available public data sets from the um, Horizon 2020 European Union Initiative. You can just download that and uh, there's already prepared data sets for training and testing, so you can you know just use that and uh, classify them to whatever the hell you want, basically, right? So the article uh, walks you through getting the data, loading it into your um, application, running feature extraction because the data sets are the raw data. So they don't actually represent anything. There's just two signals, right? And you need to extract the features from them. Then it walks you through training the actual classifier, testing and analyzing results using the testing data, I'm sorry, testing data sets. And then uh, basically improving the results with different techniques like, you know, bandpass filtering and all the other stuff that is uh, related to basic machine learning, I guess. So if you're curious and, um, as to how this could be done, how to work with that, or maybe you would just wanted to get into the basic machine learning using some data set, then this is a really good write up on how all of that works. And uh, you should try and uh, repeat that, I guess. All right. Next thing we got here is implementing Git in JavaScript. Uh, so this is essentially an introduction to a library called GitFred that provides a Git-like experience for storing content in JavaScript in memory, which is a pretty neat um, thing, I think. Um, so it basically walks you through how the library was built and what exactly it does. Uh, there's a GIF example on the screen. It looks exactly like the Git does, and it actually allows you to store all of those commits in memory and then export them and save them to the database or you know whatever the hell you want, which sounds pretty neat. So if you are curious, how you can implement a Git-like system using JavaScript, or maybe you want you just want the library to use. There is it's open source. It's available on GitHub. You can just grab it and uh, use it. It seems to be quite good, actually. Um, pretty neat, especially if you are working with uh, editors. All right. Next thing we got here is how TypeScript breaks referential transparency and what to do about it. So this is a more in-depth article on TypeScript uh, and it talks about the referential transparency as in what happens when you actually pass the value into function not by value, not in line, but actually by reference to some other objects. It works in some cases, but uh, the other cases are just broken, right? So you get errors uh, from the TypeScript compiler, I believe. And um, the author talks about why that happens and how you can actually work around that. Uh, so if you are using TypeScript and if you encounter these edge cases, this is a really good explainer on why it happens and what can you do about it. It seems like it's pretty common uh, specifically in React with JSX because uh, JSX essentially compiles to this kind of form of functions. And what can you do to basically um, solve this issue with React and TypeScript, which is kind of curious. So I didn't know that uh, TypeScript actually had problems. Like that. But yeah, check it out. All right. Next article we got here is from The Guardian. It's called Leaving Scribe. And it's a really cool uh, write up about the Scribe text editor that The Guardian uh, developers developed in 2013 and was using up until now, or I think they're still using it basically. And uh, why are they um, sort of sunsetting it and creating a new editor, which will be based on the prose mirror, which is uh, an interesting choice. So I'll be curious to see what will happen. But if you're interested to see why they created Scribe, what kind of problems they had with Scribe and why they decided to create a new editor, do check it out. There are some really cool insights over here. As you might imagine, the Guardian, um, 
basically the editor is one of the most important parts of the whole website for the article writers essentially right so they are heavily using it and there is a lot of pretty unique insights into the whole thing over here so definitely check it out if you are curious all right next article we got here is from uh dan abramov uh, his official blog over reacted and the article is titled the bug o notation and it sort of um it starts opening by you know talking about big o notation that uh measures how much slower the code will get as you throw more data at it which is a very good actually way of explaining what is big o and then it talks about so let's let's introduce the another metric called uh, bug o notation which is the bug emoji and then from n right that describes how much an api slows you down as code base grows as in how much time it will take for you to debug something once the error in this bit of code appears and then he gives an example of a specific code that you know it doesn't look very complex it's relatively easy to read but once you start thinking about this code it is not easy to understand what the hell is going on and where to start looking for a specific error and this is the whole idea of bug and notation it, he expands a lot more about you know specifics of it and i think it's a really good metric actually so if you're sort of interested in this kind of meta discussions about uh programming do check this blog out uh there is some really cool thoughts in here and uh i i feel like i'm going to be using bug on notation quite a lot more now after <laughs> reading that but yeah okay next article we got here is nearly js when regex is not enough um this is i i would call this a tutorial to this nearly js library which is a library to create custom uh syntax parsing so there's oh, what was it called it's not syntax parsing it's like custom uh god damn it i forgot the words is it like lexical no not lexical right what was the name of it let me think for a second um grammar there you go so custom grammar yeah so the article talks about starts by talking about the uh, ldap filters which are on one hand relatively straightforward right but on the other hand uh, they are really hard to parse using regular expressions because you can combine them and the combination looks like this and in the hardest case it's going to be a lot of brackets and it looks very lispy and parsing that with a regular expression is not going to be very nice i mean I, I i'm not even sure if that's possible you probably could do that somehow but that's going to be one hell of a task so the author just goes ahead and says okay so instead of using regular expressions let's use a more appropriate tool which is the grammar parsers right so in this case he uses this nearly a uh, library that i haven't heard before but i mean this you know there's not the only um available grammar library out there there's a bunch of them but they all work more or less in the same way so this is a tutorial for nearly and it walks you through setting up the nearly locally and then writing the grammar file that actually describes the grammar that should be uh, parsed and then producing the uh, resulting objects that would just uh, be plain json essentially that you can easily parse in javascript which is quite neat and yeah then there's additional code refactoring tests uh tweaking the grammar to be more relaxed and stuff like this so if you were curious about you know building your own parsers and creating your own grammars do check it out it's a really good introduction all right next thing we got here is eradicating memory leaks in javascript uh this talks about the memory management in javascript and i think memory management in general in uh, software development because this is not just talking about javascript it actually talks about uh, other languages as well saying okay there's, there's like two ways of managing memory garbage collected non-garbage collected and stuff like this uh, types of garbage collection and reference counting and all that kind of stuff if you already know how memory management in javascript works if you know what the garbage collection is if you know mark and sweep if you know all that kind of stuff you want to define anything new here um, if you don't know or don't understand all of the bits there is quite a lot of really good examples in here and a uh, pretty well uh, explained issues that might arise from you know using the code that i don't know defines variables in a loop and stuff like this while you know in some cases it's fine because the javascript engines uh, modern javascript engines know pretty well how to deal with uh relatively common things like you know redefining the variables in a loop like this for example won't really be a problem in i mean hundred thousand entries might be a problem but you know if you have like a thousand this probably garbage collection will work just fine 
but anyway, there's some really good examples and it's a really good introduction to uh, memory management and how you can actually find the memory leaks using the profiler and allocation timeline and stuff like this. So if you're curious, do check it out. Uh, before we continue, can I just note one thing? So this is article from the Dev2 and if you notice, I killed the bottom and top uh, toolbars from Dev2 using my ad blocker because it is annoying how much space they take on my screen. And you know, I have to do the podcast. I do it in a zoomed in page. So this is more zoom than I typically have. And the more you zoom in, the more space those toolbars take. And I just couldn't, couldn't bear it anymore. I just killed them. I know that some of Dev2 guys watch me and uh, if you are developing Dev2 and if you're watching this, please allow us to hide those bloody toolbars. They can be really annoying. Okay, uh, continue. We got the TypeScript tax, a cost versus benefit analysis. This is an article from Eric Elliott. Uh, he is a pretty good author, but he tends to be very extreme in his opinions. So I would recommend taking this article with a grain of salt. So don't take all of that for a fact. Um, the article itself is actually quite good. There are again some extreme points here that I'm not sure I completely agree with, but it's a really good insight into um, essentially evaluating if you need a TypeScript in your projects and how much would it help if you would add it to your stack? Would it actually bring enough benefit to you? And if you should actually do that, if it would improve your development experience or you know, if it's, if it's worth it basically, right? So this is the whole article uh, comes down to it. And there is a lot of interesting thoughts here. Once again, a lot of them are very extreme and very um, categorical, right? So it's just like, this is the only way it has to be. This is not enough benefits for us, but I think it should be, it's, it's a very personal thing anyway, right? But um, I would say that it's an interesting article to read anyway, just take it with a grain of salt. So if you're curious, if you're evaluating the need to take TypeScript up and add it to your stack, use it at your work, uh, then do check this article out. It has some interesting thoughts, but once again, don't take it for granted. There, uh, they are, Some of them are a bit too extreme in my opinion. All right. Next article we got here is creating a custom shader in 3.js. Uh, this is actually, we already switched to the tiny bits, uh, you know, tiny small things and interesting uh, minor, whatever, non-articles, uh, minor tutorials. So this one is uh, introducing you to building a shaders in 3.js. It's a very small tutorial that essentially shows you how to build vertex shaders using 3.js and how to show them using the, uh, WebGL and web, uh, which is, you know, if you are into 3JS, do check it out. If not, then I, I honestly, I have zero idea about the shaders and then WebGL and all of that stuff, but it's always fascinating to read about that. It always looks like, you know, it's not that hard to do, but then I look at the shader format and go like, what the hell is happening here? But if you are working with it or want to get into that, that is a really neat one. The next article we got here, a tiny one is also about volume rendering uh, with WebGL talks about volume rendering and how do you can actually do that. There is a lot of uh, trigonometry here and a lot of uh, WebGL related things, including shaders. And again, I understand literally nothing about that, but if you are working with WebGL and if you were curious about the volume rendering, do check it out. This looks to be quite good. Again, I don't understand half of it because I literally have zero knowledge about WebGL. All right. Um, Next thing we got here is what is tree shaking and how does it work? This is a very short explainer on what tree shaking is and how exactly does it work and why do you wanna, wanna have it, right? So if you already know how the tree shaking works and uh, you know understand it at a basic level, then won't really find anything new here. But if you're curious, what is this tree shaking and uh, how exactly, why do people so excited about this and, and how do you use it and why do you want it? This article will give you all you want to know about that. All right. Next thing we got here is a tiny article from the CodePen. Uh, it's called The Web is Made of Edge Cases, which is a very uh, neat way of looking at it. Basically, the idea is that, yes, the web is literally made of edge cases and wh wherever you look, there will be some problem, right? So like your your Website won't download intact because there are content blockers, DNS issues, browser bugs, privacy enforcers, meddling ISPs, and a bunch of other problems. And there's always a chance that something will go wrong. People insist on being unique, you know, and there's like, uh, yeah, user zoom, user styles, plugins, disabled JavaScript, and a bunch of other things, right? 
And there is a very interesting list of that. And it's very uh, curious to think about it. The fact that, you know, you actually, when you, uh, when you build for web, you cannot just assume that everything will work, which is kind of, uh, I guess it was way easier when I worked for the mobile devices, because you always know, you know, especially when you work for iOS, for example, you always know the hardware, exact hardware, you always know the exact sizes of the screens and stuff like this. And you always know exactly what's going to happen when, when you build for the web, half of that is not true. It's like, yeah, there's a really good examples over here of what, what might go wrong, including the, you know, speed of connections, for example, or I don't know, people will use their website the way they want. Well, this is actually true for all the applications, not just web, but yeah. And uh, it's, it's, it's just an interesting thought that I guess it kind of, you know, was somewhere in my head, but I never gave too much thought to it, but this is a really cool way to look at the web development. And why is it so hard in the first place? Because there is a lot of edge cases. All right. Next thing we got here is a uh, advice from Dan Abramov that says, open your ESLint config, disable all style linting rules or add ESLint config prettier, which does that install prettier. You'll thank me. Uh, you'll thank me later. Linters are there to help you find mistakes in your code, not torture you. If your linter tortures you, it's not your fault. Look at every linting rule and thing. Does this rule help me find bugs? If not, turn it off, which is a very sound advice. I've been using um, ESLint Airbnb config and I think I've disabled like 90% of it already. <laughs> I'm like walking around and thinking, okay, I should probably write my own that wouldn't have a bunch of that stuff, but I'm being too lazy about that. I would really love to see a very simple ESLint config that would be focused on just prettier and just bugs, right? So I don't want any styling or anything. It's like prettier works perfectly fine for me. So if you're still suffering from your linter, just turn it off. All right, next thing we got here is Twitter blocking me because I opened too many things, uh, is the announcement from Google team, specifically from Eddie Osmani, is saying that the priority hints are coming to Chrome. Priority hints is the uh, way to hint the importance of a resource to prioritize downloading it sooner or later. You will be able to, for example, assign the priority the importance um, attribute to the image tag to say when it's gonna be downloaded. And this sounds really cool. So essentially you would um, be able to do lazy loading without actually implementing any JavaScript, which sounds uh, really awesome. You also have the same API working for fetch and for links, as in, you know, you can preload uh, scripts or preload CSS and do that with a lower importance. There is an official spec and there is an intent to implement from Chrome team over here. So if you're interested, check it out. That seems pretty neat. Uh, next thing we got here is Chrome API update will kill a bunch of other extensions, not just ad blockers. Uh, this is actually an ongoing, I, I would I mean, I'll probably call it a drama actually. So the Chrome developers decided to change the extension uh, APIs and um, disallow a bunch of current APIs that are critical for a wide range of extensions. Uh, this article talks about the extensions other than ad blockers or content blockers that would suffer from these changes, but there is also a pretty in-depth comment uh, from uh, Raymond Hill, who is known as well as Gore Hill, who is the maintainer of uh, uBlock Origin and uMetrics, this, that are absolutely amazing blocking extensions that I use pretty much daily. And um, he essentially says that as soon as those changes are made, uh, the only way that the ad blocking in Chrome would work or resource blocking in Chrome would work is using this declarative net request API that enforces the ad block plus compatibility, right? So this is the only way and it's not provides enough flexibility to allow uBlock Origin and uMetrics to work anymore. So they will no longer exist, which is, I, if they would go through it, I feel like I would just switch to Firefox because this is essentially, they're just limiting what the extensions can do uh, in a very, very serious ways. So uh, the only way to block stuff would be through the net declarative net requests API, which is kind of limited. And yeah, it's it's it doesn't look very good right now. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of flame in this discussion, which was deleted at one point. There's a lot of deleted comments. I'm really hoping the Google dev team will relook, you know, re-evaluate the whole thing and change their decision on that because that is not a nice way to go in my opinion. But yeah, there you go. If you're curious, do check out the, both uh, the article and the thread here. There is a lot of insights into the whole situation. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
not the changes I would love to see to Chrome. Okay, next thing we got here is the changes I would like to see in Chrome. This is the new feature shipping in Chrome 73. It's called log points and it allows you to add the log points to just about any line of code, which will log, well, anything from that specific uh, scope. In this case, you can see the example um, that logs the object uh, to do's, which extracts the to do's from the uh, specific class in line. So no more console log, you can just log anything on a runtime or during debugging or whatever the hell you want, which looks really useful. But um, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think I'm still gonna use console log a bit too much, uh, even though this feature looks absolutely amazing for some cases. All right, next thing we got here is Yarn's future version two and beyond. This is a pretty detailed write up on the plans of the Yarn team um, on what's coming next, what's gonna change, what's what are the new features, what is the overall philosophy and what are the goals for 2019. So if you are still using Yarn, I know I am because it's still faster and more consistent than NPM. And then uh, yeah, do check it out. There is some pretty cool things like for example, the log file will finally become a proper format and will be a strict subset of YAML, which is quite nice and should make a diffs um, quite a lot nicer than it, they are right now. Yeah, so do check it out. Um, next thing we got here is a pretty big thing. So React 16.8.0 is nearly released. So this is a pre-release pull request uh, made by Dan Abramov. And the highlight of 16.8 is the hooks that are now enabled in master by default that are, will be shipped with this release. I am thinking somewhere next week likely because it seems everything is ready. You know, the tests are there, the hooks are working, everyone's happy. So they just need to release it. And of course they won't release it on Friday when this pull request was created. So I guess we're gonna see it uh, sometime early next week, which is absolutely awesome. I cannot wait to use hooks in production. So there you go. All right, now we are coming to the releases section. The first release we got here is Pre-Tier 116 that uh, adds uh, HTML improvements and better CRLF handling. And uh, yeah, as, as usual, the change list is insane. So if you want to check it out, Pre-Tier is still one of the must have tools in my opinion. It's something that I'm, I don't think I ever used any other, you know, I, I don't use editors anymore that don't have Pre-Tier installed. So yeah, uh, there you go. It's just getting better and better. Next thing we got here is Neutralino 1.10 uh, released, which adds the file picker, directory read feature, and uh, binding to random port and multiple HTML layout support. If you have not heard about Neutralino, it seems like my GitHub became mobile for some reason. Uh, Neutralino is an alter uh, alternative to Electron that is uh, supposed to be lightweight and portable that essentially um, has the core that you install and then has a separate component for the application that makes the app itself smaller. So it's sort of like, I don't know, what, what would I compare to it? Like a .NET framework, I guess, right? So you install the .NET framework itself and then you install smaller apps, uh, which is a valid idea, but I never tried it, but you know, it seems to be developing quite nicely. So if you're curious, do check it out. Next release we got here is Babel 7.3.0 that adds uh, name capture groups for regular expressions that um, moves the private instant accessors to stage three moves the smart pipeline operator to stage one, which is probably the most exciting change for me, uh, improves the TypeScript support and um, adds the, um, the Babel ESLint now reads from your Babel config finally, that took a while, but <laughs> there you go. So if you are using Babel, make sure to update. There seems to be a lot of improvements there. Next release we got here is NP version 4.0. Uh, this is a pretty cool um, better NPM publish tool from Syndra Soros. And if you are uh, publishing a lot of tools to NPM, then check it out. It simplifies the process quite a bit. If you're using it, make sure to update to version four. There is a lot of improvements and the major breaking change is essentially dropping the everything, all the nodes uh, lower than node eight. All right. Next release we got here is a pretty big one. We got Ionic 4, uh, which is a very major release that um, essentially migrates the Ionic from just being an Angular thing to web components. So you can now actually use Ionic with, well, just about any other framework that can export stuff to web components, which is kind of neat. Ionic is a mobile framework. So if you never heard about it, it allows you to build mobile apps using web technologies. 
It is based on Cordova. So essentially what you're getting is um, web browser plus some backend stuff uh, running on your phone. There are valid cases for that, but um, yeah, it's like, you know, I, 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 I'm not sure if it's worth doing it when you have native base and React Native. So it's like, I guess there are some cases when you would want that. Uh, hey, Donna, thank you so much for your donation. Uh, yes, indeed. Uh, finally, finally, glad you finally was able to attend this stream, man. <laughs> All right, continuing. Uh, that was it for releases. We now have the libraries and demo section where we have quite a lot of actually really neat stuff this time around. So the first thing I want to highlight is this practical, no oh, sorry, portable node guide, a practical guide on how to write portable cross-platform Node.js code. Uh, it's a pretty neat collection of things you have to keep in mind when you want to write uh, libraries and packages and, and applications in Node.js that should work on all platforms. Um, it starts by saying that this is important because 24% of all developers use Windows, 41 use Mac, and 85 use Linux, and 1% use BSD in production. Which, uh, like this 1% that use BSD is just absolutely blowing my mind. I'm, I, it's like, I, I don't... <laughs> It's insane, but uh, there you go. And yeah, it's just it's essentially a collection of uh, best practices, pointers and tips and caveats related to, uh, you know, things you have to keep in mind when building uh, Node.js libraries and tools. Things like, you know, directory locations, system configuration, new line endings, file path, file names, shell and environmental variables sim links and all that kind of things the things that you typically don't even think about when you build for one platform right you just use whatever you have and then when you start thinking okay so how do i do that on windows turns out half of those things work in a completely different way so if you are writing cross-platform modules and if you need this kind of guide then this is a really really good collection of things and i would highly recommend checking it out all right Next thing we got here is uh, FNM, Fast and Simple Node Version Module uh, Manager, goddammit, uh, built in ReasonML. So this is an alternative to NVM, which is a node, uh, God damn it, node version manager. And uh, yeah, it's essentially, you know, the idea is that it's way faster than NVM uh, because NVM can be a bit slow sometimes, especially if you are not running off SSD. This one is built using ReasonML and is apparently lightning fast. So I like, I don't know, I, I use NVM uh, myself, but I typically only do that when I need to test. So I have the, you know, I have the system node, which is the latest available 11, I think 11, nine now or whatever. And then I use NVM to install the older versions uh, to whenever I need to test just to make sure, you know, to make sure it works or if, if I have something like node SAS that doesn't compile for the latest node, whatever, which can be a bit annoying, but there you go. Uh, so this is, yeah, this is just a faster version. I, I don't know, maybe you are annoyed by NVM not being fast enough for you and you use it daily. Check it out, uh, looks quite nice. Um, there is a lot of planned features here, so make sure to check them out. I don't think it supports uh, all the features of NVM just yet, but looks like a nice addition to Node ecosystem. All right, next thing we got here is Mozart, a simple JavaScript pattern for slim organized Ajax applications. This is for all of you people who don't want any frameworks uh, and just wanna write HTML and a tiny bit of JavaScript. This is essentially what it allows you to do. You just write, uh, you just create this Mozart instance that can be, well, I, I'm not sure why my author uses this m.form format, uh, but yeah, this is the way. Then you can define routes, you can define APIs, you can define events, and essentially it will do the updates, sort of trigger the updates for you. And I mean, you know, with, um, with a React in this world, I'm not sure I need that, but maybe you do. Maybe you just wanna do something very simple. So check it out. Next thing we got here is a web component for spinning progress, a simple spinning loading web component based on one of the Mac OS. Um, I think there should be an example somewhere. I don't wanna translate anything, but uh, no, it doesn't seem like there is any examples here, but anyway, this is a web component that adds spinning indicator. Ah, there's a demo, there we go. They should work much better. Uh, and there is your spinner. So it's a very simple web component that adds a spinner. And uh, I mean, it's literally one tag, which is super nice. So if you were looking for a spinner component uh, that is a web component 
uh, uses shadow DOM and everything, does not mess with your style, then just 900 bytes gzipped, which is kind of cool. So yeah, quite nice to check it out. Next thing we got here is Defi, a bunch of utilities that enable accessor-based reactivity on JavaScript objects. Uh, this library looks uh, very similar to, well, just about any other reactive library out there, like RxJS or Bacon or whatever, but you know, a slightly different uh, taste, I guess. It's instead of going for a functional approach like what you would have in RxJS, as in when you wrap the object into observable and then uh, match, and then I, I guess you cannot really do that with observable, right? Or I guess you could, but that would be a bit more complex. This allows you to observe changes on specific properties of objects. Uh, and it uses, I imagine it uses proxies under the hand. Uh, I'm sorry, under the hood, not under the hand. But yeah, essentially it allows you to monitor all the object for changes. I don't know if I like the API. It looks okay, but uh, with the, you know, with the ES6 proxies existing and having stuff like, uh, um, what is it? React simple state or wait, React easy state, right? React easy state. Uh, like the way that the React easy state handles it is so much better. So like I would, I guess if I would want to have a library like this, I would prefer it to be as simple as a, just using a wrapper function and then it being reactive by default, which would be the best thing, right? But uh, anyway, it's, it's a nice library and maybe you need that. Uh, do check it out. Next thing we got here is React VASM, declarative WebAssembly instantiation for React. If you wanted to use a WebAssembly component, or sorry, WebAssembly uh, library in your React using React tags, now you can. I, I'm not even sure why you would want to do that, but um, yeah, now you can do that. So there you go, declarative WebAssembly loading in your React components. I, I guess, I guess may maybe you do, maybe not, but there you go. It, it, it exists now because of course it does. Right, the next thing we got here is the hotkey library from GitHub folks, and it's a global DOM element activation uh, on the hotkey exactly. So it allows you to define data hotkey property on just about any link or element, right? And then you can use the hotkey library to install the hotkeys on those elements. And then the pressing this key will activate the specific a, I guess, you know, href or button or whatever the hell you bind it to essentially, which seems pretty neat. So this looks like a pretty nice uh, library. So if you need that, do check it out. Next thing we got here is TXI, small focus text, uh, full text indexing and search library for any JavaScript application. Just as it says, it's a text indexing, so it allows you to throw in just about any uh, text or for some reason, even objects and then search over those things to find the best match uh, with the scores and everything. Not sure to what exactly algorithm does it uses under the hood, but there is some uh, pretty in-depth explanation of all the uh, internals here. So if you are looking for full text indexing, specifically in JavaScript, do check it out. Seems to be quite nice. Next thing we got here is VS Code Browser Preview Extension, a real browser preview in start your, uh, inside your editor that you can debug. So um, yeah, this literally adds a browser panel inside of VS Code. Uh, this does require you to have uh, Chrome installed, so it uses the Chrome, but you can now run and debug the browser thing right inside of the VS Code, which looks absolutely mind blowing. And you get the um, uh, debugger from VS Code hooked up to this instance of the browser, which is really, really cool. So if you're working on the front end a lot, do check this out, seems to be very nice. All right, next thing we got here is polyethylene, functional programming for iterables and async iterables. Um, I use live server. Yeah, live server is also an option. I typically also do that as well. So just like hot reloading and then you can, you know, bind the debugger to the um, running Chrome anyway. So, I mean, you know, there's some people that don't like to leave their VS code, which I guess this is the extension for them then. Okay, coming back to polyethylene, uh, this is the function that's, oh, sorry, the, uh, God damn it, the library that allows you to uh, work with iterators and async iterators in sort of chaining functional way. Uh, honestly, looks very, very similar to our XJS Bacon and, and just about any other reactive programming library. Allows you to react on the changes from iterable, right? So this one seems to be only working with iterable, so you don't actually get any 
observable features, but if you want a lightweight thing, do check it out. Maybe this is what you want. Okay, next thing we got here is PageRaw, a UI builder for React web apps. So there's been a lot of, you know, UI builders that are based along React. This one is actually open source and allows you to build, it's like, seems like it's a full featured editor, which looks just quite nice. So I've, I've tried the editor. Let me just allow the JavaScript over here. Um, there is my editor, there you go. So you can, you can literally edit everything in here. Uh, it, my, my zoom might be, whoops, that, no, 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 no. What are you doing? Oh no, God damn it. It zoomed the wrong thing, okay. Um, so, no, no, why don't you zoom? There we go, okay, let me try this way. There we go, this is what I wanted to do. So you can actually, you know, you can actually see the components, you can toggle their properties, you can edit the code uh, directly. And all of that happens directly in one window, which is quite nice. So if you're looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is electronegativity, a tool to identify misconceptions. Okay, it's hard to talk sometimes. A tool to identify misconfiguration and security anti-patterns and electron applications. This is essentially what I would call um, security linter. So it takes your Electron app and lints and you know looks at the code and finds the security anti-patterns and tells you what is wrong and what you should change to make your app more secure, which is a really great tool. So if you're working on Electron apps, do check it out. This seems to be very useful. All right, next thing we got here is Lighthouse CI. Run Lighthouse in CI using Docker. Um, Exactly as it says, it allows you to run Lighthouse re and get Lighthouse reports, including, you know, setting thresholds and stuff like this in CI uh, using Docker container. You do need to get the Lighthouse API key from the Google uh, for that. But yeah, you know, if you're working uh, on the app and it's important for you to have a good uh, Lighthouse score, then you can now enforce that using this uh, Lighthouse CI tool, which looks quite neat actually. So there you go. And it seems like you can actually run your own server. I didn't notice that last time. So you can just run your own um, Lighthouse CI server and then you don't need the token from Google. You can just make your own. This is, I'm not even sure if it's token from Google to be honest now because the link here leads to the uh, Google form. So maybe I'm mistaken. This is not from Google at all. It just was posted by I think Edios Money on Twitter. This is why I, th I was thinking it was a Google product but maybe I'm just mistaken. So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is Launchpad for RxJS. This is a really neat collection of uh, basically all the available RxJS operators split by the categories, which is really nice and allows you to quickly find whatever the hell you need. And there's even links to the reactive how that uh, dynamically show you what exactly does those functions do with regards to a specific um, God damn it, specific operator is what I'm trying to say, God damn it. So yeah, if you are working with RxJS and you always forget the operators, I know I do, then this website basically has everything you want right here in a very convenient format. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is Shards React, a React UI kit uh, that looks very nice. Like it has a lot of components and it's MIT licensed, uh, requires React 16.5, and there is, yeah, there's a ton of things here. So if you want another, you know, if you're looking for a good React components library, do check it out. This looks quite nice. Next thing we got here is Vasm Vinforms. We already had a demo of this uh, some time ago. I'm just gonna reload this again. I think I showed it about a month ago, maybe, maybe even more than that. Uh, this is like literally WebAssembly Vinforms. Uh, it should be loading, right? I think it just takes some time. It maybe was updated. Let me just open this. Run. It worked. It worked before. Um, <laughs> whoops, that is the wrong button. Come on, load already. There are some errors in the console. No, okay, it's low. Okay, so it, it just takes a very long time. Oh, no, now, now, now it's frozen. Okay, there we go. There we go. So this is the literally Vinforms, right? And all of them are working. So this is compiled to WebAssembly. We already had that demo some time ago. And now it's open sourced. So you can actually look how it was built, how it's working, how you can compile it yourself. So if you ever wanted to build, what is, what is, no, debugger. I don't want debugger. 
to open that. Oh, there you go. You can. You, there's even a calculator built in WinForms that runs on WebAssembly. It, yeah, like that, that's a thing. It, it, it actually works. <laughs> So if you are curious how that works, do check it out. It is actually quite fascinating. Uh, next thing we got is another WebAssembly demo. It's called runnerb.io and it allows you to run Ruby in your browser through WebAssembly. So this is essentially Ruby compiled to WebAssembly that you can just you know run in your browser and compile things and um, play with Ruby essentially over here. Obviously you won't get any file system access or anything like that, but all the basic Ruby features are here and working, which is kind of, Great, so if you ever wanted to try Ruby, give it a shot. Um, I personally used Ruby uh, back in university, so my uh, my thesis was written in Ruby, uh, and I really like language. It's a very nice language. It has a lot of really cool features. So if you ever wanted to get into it, uh, you can now do it in the browser. <laughs> okay, that is it for libraries and demos. I got some silly stuff for you. Um, in case you are not reading XKCD when you should, there's a new comic called Internet Archive and it talks about, you know, all the awesome uh, internet services that we get for free. And uh, it's kind of scary to think that they can just disappear when someone stops maintaining them, right? So if you are using Wikipedia, if you are using Internet Archive, be sure to donate to them from time to time because this is what keeps them alive, right? And I would honestly want to see a governmental support for stuff like this, which is kind of, I think makes sense, right? Those are really important services. But anyway, this is a great comic and a great point. Uh, next thing we got here is a tweet from uh, Nicholas T. Zakas, who is the author of uh, ESLint. And the tweet goes like this, mom, dad said you invented a thing, ESLint, me, yes, mom, what is it? Me, it fi finds and fixes problems in JavaScript. Mom, huh, do people use it? Me. Basically everyone using JavaScript. Mom, how much did you make on it? Me, nothing. Mom, I don't understand your industry. Me, me either. That's a very good description of a state of uh, open source industry. It's like we have so many amazing tools and people work on them a long time. And even if the tool is widely spread and widely used, you might not earn a dime from it, which is, I mean, it, let, let's be honest, it's very sad. It's a very sad state of things and I really hope that someone at one point can figure out how to make this work for everyone so that the maintainers and creators of open source tools can actually live from that if their tool is successful, which would be the perfect case. But um, yeah, there you go. Uh, next thing we got here is a really cool article from Guardian called The Internet, but not as we know it, live online in China, Cuba, India, and Russia. If you ever were curious about how does the internet looks in the countries where, you know, there's the very heavily enforced censorship online is going like China, Cuba, India, or Russia, do have a read of this article. There is some absolutely insane things happening. And, you know, if you live outside, you would never think about that. Like this is not something that you think about as a person living in a democratic country let's just put it this way right but when you read about that and i kind of I, I read the russian news being russian myself from time to time you know reading about what they kind of implement in russia to enforce the law in the internet is just absolutely mind-boggling and insane at, at the times and right now they want to go as far as to create the for example russian internet that will be disconnected from the rest of the internet and the access you will only be able to get the access to Russian internet by your passport. So you, you would need to like actually acquire credentials from the government to go online, which is like, I, yeah, it's, it's, it's insane what some of those governments do. And if you wanted to know, you know, um, a bit more about that, do give it a read. It's a really good article and there's some very cool things in here. All right. Next thing we got here is, uh, can you spot when you're being fished? A uh, fishing quiz from Google. This one is tricky, so do give it a shot and try to figure out uh, if you can actually spot if you are being fished online in the emails primarily. There is, I think I got, I think they got me one time. So one time I thought it was real, but it was actually phishing. It is really damn hard from time to time to figure out if that's a phishing or not. There are some really devious techniques out there. 
So if you want to check if you are good or not, do check it out. They also, they are not just telling you if you're right or wrong, but they also explain how to use spots that you are being fished, which is also really cool. So I would uh, highly recommend taking this quiz, even if you think you know everything, because there are some very devious techniques out there. All right. And the last thing I got here for today to close this off is the news from the AlphaGo team, from the DeepMind team, uh, AlphaStar, the new AI that they presented uh, that played StarCraft 2. It played StarCraft 2 against two uh, StarCraft pros, uh, one being Mana and the other one being TLO. It won uh, nine games out of 10, or what was it 10 games? I think it was like something 10 to one. So basically 10 uh, for AI and one game for the StarCraft pros. And just because, you know, like eventually the StarCraft pro finally figured out how to sort of fight against it, I guess. And it was absolutely fascinating to watch. So there is a YouTube video somewhere here. Uh, there it is. Uh, that is about, an, I think it's an hour long or something. Two, okay, two, three hours long. There is, uh, okay, actually two hours long. There is, it absolutely is fascinating to watch how the DeepMind plays StarCraft, especially if you know how does StarCraft 2 works, if you know the way that pros play. There are some things that it does that just do not come to mind when you watch the, the pros just go like, why is it doing that? And then it turns out that there was some very weird strategy that actually works out correctly in the end. It is damn fascinating. And if you have any even slight interest in gaming or slight interest in, in AI, I would highly recommend watching at least one of the games. If you would watch one, then watch the last one in the end. It was like the live game. Um, where the, I think Mana was playing against the um, Alpha Star. It is really, really cool. And the article as well, like the article has some te technical details on how the Alpha Star was trained, what is the, you know, how much time it actually took and so on and so forth. Uh, it is really, really cool. So if you have, again, if you have any, you know, any interest in AI or any interest in StarCraft or in your, any interest in gaming, do check it out. Right, that is actually it from my side. So this was uh, BXJS Weekly. Uh, you can, as usual, find all the links mentioned in the GitHub. Uh, the link should be in the description to the channel or to the video or to the sound that you're listening right now, wherever you're watching or listening this. If you have any more things um, that you think I might've missed, you're watching this right now in chat, uh, feel free to throw it into the chat. If you have any questions, suggestions or whatever, throw it into the chat right now. If you're watching this later on on YouTube or wherever, um, feel free to leave a comment or come to our Discord server and talk to us there about JavaScript, gaming, or whatever the hell you want. Otherwise, let's wrap this up here and go have awesome uh, weekend or rest of the week. Yeah, it doesn't seem like um, anyone has anything else to add. So once again, guys, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Donna, thank you again for your donation. Really appreciate that. Right, so this is basically all I have for today. Uh, there's a small announcement. There won't be any dev stream on Wednesday because I'm going to be traveling for work, but we are going to have another BXS weekly on Saturday. So yeah, this is basically it. Uh, thank you guys for watching. I hope you enjoyed it and I see you next time. Bye.